Welcome back, everyone, to part two of this lecture series on Goffman stigma. It's great to see that you haven't abandoned me just yet. Please don't. There's much more in store for you in the second half of this semester. Okay, so we've been learning about Goffman's framework for thinking about the subordinate role of stigma in society as well as in the workplace. Let's continue with this exploration by having a look at the second half of the book, shall we? As we've already learned, the stigmatized are frequently subjected to various forms of prejudice, discrimination, ridicule, and mistreatment. The stigma that they carry is an indicator of a subordinate status within the wider social order. But there are, according to Goffman, two types of people who are sympathetic to the stigmatized, what he calls the own and what he calls the wise. The own are those who share the same stigma. As mentioned previously, when stigmatized people are with their own kind, so to speak, they are not subject to prejudice, discrimination, ridicule, or mistreatment. They are treated like equals because they are equals. There is a sense of solidarity and friendship among the similarly stigmatized. They automatically bond with each other because they understand what it's like to face the dominant community of normals. This connection is based on shared experiences in social life. The stigma that they carry is not a stigma in the absence of normals. When the stigmatized interact with each other, they are often a source of moral support and knowledge on how best to manage either information or tension surrounding the stigma. They exchange tips or best practices on how to survive and indeed how to thrive despite the stigma that they carry. Oftentimes, the own form social movements, and they lobby on behalf of the interests of the group. The Changing Faces campaign that you looked at previously is a good example of this. Then there are what Goffman calls the wise. These are normals, but as a result of their special situation, they are sympathetic to the stigmatized, and they serve as honorary members of the group. The wise are often close relatives or friends who have a courtesy stigma in solidarity with the stigmatized. Particularly, employees who work with the stigmatized are often considered to be wise. Doctors and nurses, for example, frequently deal with stigmatized people, so much so that they come to be seen as wise themselves. They do not see the stigma as a stigma. They see the individual, the patient, nothing more, nothing less. These wise people are allies in the fight for equality. There is no or very little tension when stigmatized individuals interact with the wise. Now, a stigma can be acquired at any time during the life course. Some people are born with a stigma, and it stays with them forever. Being an orphan is, according to Goffman, a good example. Other people are born with a stigma, and then they lose it in later life. This might involve, for example, those born with a physical deformity that is subsequently corrected through cosmetic surgery. Yet other people are born normals and acquire a stigma later in life. This might include, for example, people who were left disabled after an accident or an illness. Goffman observes that children who are born with a stigma are often protected in their youth by a family that staves off the lack of acceptance by wider society. It is usually not until a child gets to school that he or she realizes that they have a stigma. The other children, of course, are sure to remind them of the fact. Regardless, everyone with a stigma will face what Goffman calls 
a moment of truth or a moment of reckoning when they realize that they are discredited in the eyes of other normals. This moment of truth usually happens in public, for example, at school or at work. The moment of reckoning also happens in job interviews, where the stigmatized first perceive real and lasting discrimination. Discriminatory employment practices are rife and can have a lasting effect on one's life chances. Goffman later observes that a stigma gained later in life is especially difficult for an ex-normal to manage. Someone who has, for example, from birth, never been a normal, is gradually acclimatized to the status of stigmatized. But when someone who was once a normal becomes suddenly discredited, this can be a very difficult situation to cope with. Furthermore, the shift from discreditable to discredited is difficult to manage as well because you can no longer conceal the stigma. It is simply out in the open for all to see. Have a look at this video where a gunshot victim describes her life after the injury. Imagine what your life would be like if you had been similarly maimed. And think about how this story relates to Goffman's framework. We're going to begin tonight with an inspiring story of personal courage and medical triumph. You are about to meet a woman who, as a teenager, had her face blown apart by an accidental shotgun blast. It was a miracle that she even survived, but now, more than a decade later, with a family of her own, she's undergone a remarkable procedure that has once again altered her life, this time for the better. Her journey is amazing, but we want you to know that some of the pictures you are about to see are very disturbing. Ashley Banfield has the exclusive report. I had gorgeous blue eyes. I had a darker blonde hair, uh, had a nice tan. <laughs> Um, I've always had nice shaped eyebrows. I was very beautiful, uh, naturally beautiful. For the last 11 years, Chrissy Steltz has been living without a face. There's a gaping hole where her eyes, nose, and cheeks used to be. Alrighty. Uh -huh. Okay. But today, through the miracle of science and the kindness of doctors, she's about to get a brand new face, just like her pictures, only aged to reflect the decade that's passed. She was only 16 years old when it happened. She'd left home and was living with her boyfriend, but she still attended school every day, getting straight A's, until everything changed. Her friends robbed a country store and stole dozens of guns. Chrissy was in the getaway car. Then one night, when a group of teenagers were drinking at her apartment, someone started fooling around with a stolen shotgun. My words were put that down before you kill somebody, and he told me it's not loaded. The blast that followed took two-thirds of Chrissy's face with it. I don't know if you've ever seen like a wounded animal trying to get up. That's what I saw. I saw an injury that nobody survives, except somebody really strong, and she was trying to get up. Chrissy was rushed to the hospital, where one of the first people to see her was Dr. Eric Dirks a maxillofacial surgeon who would remain in her life for the next decade. The blast itself removed the contents of her left eye socket, removed her nose and the supporting midfacial structures, and damaged her right eye to the extent that she lost vision. Have you ever seen anything like Chrissy Steltz's case? I've not seen anything quite so severe where the patient lived. In a coma and hospitalized for six weeks, Chrissy had no idea what had happened to her when she regained consciousness. And she was never going to see again or smell. And that hurt. She didn't have a nose. And she didn't have eyes. That they were gone. When I finally knew what had happened to me, that I had lost my sight and that it would never be coming back, I knew I could sit back and I could have a pity party or I could figure out what to do and go about doing it, and that's exactly what I did. And thus began Chrissy's 11-year odyssey. First, she'd have to go out in public, and an oversized sleep shade was her mask of choice. 
Have you ever felt people staring at you? Have you known that people are staring at you, even mm-hmm. though you can't see them staring uh, yeah, at you? I've, I've definitely known. And uh, I, like I said, I've never let it bother me. In fact, if I see, if I realize or am informed of someone staring, I'll wave often. And it embarrasses them once they realize that a blind person has somehow spotted them, you know. Next up, graduation from high school, still with straight A's. And then the high school prom. You suffered a gunshot wound to the face (laughs) at 16, and you graduated on time, straight A's. Yes. You realize this is completely (laughs) unheard of. You know, it's part of who I am. After that, classes for the blind, where she'd meet Jeffrey Dilger, who was also blinded at 16. They fell in love and have been together ever since. (laughs) And 11 months ago, Jeffrey Jr. arrived. A daunting new addition for two blind parents. It's almost as though you don't even know you're blind. Yeah. (laughs) But most difficult of all, the year-long multi-surgery marathon to rebuild the bowl-shaped crater that had been left in her face. One of the most extensive prosthetic facial surgeries doctors have ever attempted. Damaged tissue had to be removed. A breathing passage had to be opened to her nasal cavity. Eight Dental implants were drilled into her facial bones with magnets affixed to the tips so that this prosthetic face could snap on and snap off. Year after year, Chrissy was refused insurance coverage. They called it an aesthetic procedure. They don't want to pay for prosthetics to them. Um, as long as you can still walk and breathe, you're fine. This is certainly not a, you know, a, a veneer on a, on a front tooth. It's just as much of a medical necessity to me as an artificial arm or a leg. Dr. Larry Over and Dr. David Trainer are maxillofacial prosthodontists who, like Dr. Dirks, are working for free. The steps to rebuild her face, complete with natural character and realistic eyes, is part science and part artistry. A plaster cast is made of Chrissy's face. Then silicone is poured into the mold to form the skin-toned facial features. It's baked to seal in texture and color, then painted to reflect the natural flaws of human skin. And then comes the makeup. We got you blushing beige or whatever it was. (laughs) There is eyeliner, eyeshadow, and mascara baked right into the mask. Chrissy's got this uh, favorite makeup of hers, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll put that on and seal it onto the pussy so she doesn't have to keep reapplying it. It's like the fake tattooing of makeup. Mm. Lashes are poked into the silicone with tweezers. The eye and the mouth are the only areas of the body that are shiny. Positioning the acrylic eyes is critical, since so much of what we feel about people comes from looking directly into their eyes. Getting the gaze... So when you look, both eyes are looking the same way, and that little glint is in the same position. And finally, the moment she's been waiting for. And let's put it on and make sure it fits. There we go. (laughs) And the net effect of all this work might be best measured by the reaction from her family and friends, who've gathered to see her with a face for the first time in a decade. Miss America. (laughs) Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, Shy. And look, without the glasses. Oh, my God. That's great. Oh, my God. Thank you. From her mother, tears of joy. She looks beautiful. And her doctors, deep gratification. What were your first thoughts for her when you saw the completed product on her face? It was like she's whole again. You feel that? Mm-hmm. While everyone in the room sees Chrissy in a whole new way, Chrissy still can't see a thing. But that's not the point. She says this isn't just for her. It's for her little boy, Jeffrey. Yummy. Who's only ever known his mommy in a big black mask. I feel like I'm living for him more in a, a regular world where he can look at mom and see she looks as regular as everybody else. But first, the sleep mask goes back on. She wants to reveal the new look slowly, worried it might scare him. Junior. He's looking at us. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. Did he look that thing? But apart from a smile, Jeffrey seems to barely notice. For him, it turns out, 
nothing has changed. You've not minding it one bit. What do you think Jeffrey sees when he sees you now? I think he sees his mother. He sees that mom doesn't need the mask anymore. And perhaps that is the reason for this. Knowing what you have now, if you could do it all over again, would you change anything? You know, I wouldn't think so. I mean, I... I feel blessed, and if, if I were to change any one thing, I'd be afraid it would change everything. Now, as Chrissy goes about her everyday life, like taking her little sister to the mall, she no longer feels the stares of strangers. Chrissy, what is it that you want most now of everything? To be looked at as a plain Jane, like everyone else. To be treated just like everyone else. For Nightline, this is Ashley Banfield in Portland, Oregon. It is fascinating, isn't it? the extent of our efforts to appear normal, how far we're willing to go, how even toddlers are sensitive to deviations from normality. Okay, now Goffman goes on to discuss the vital role of social information in managing stigma. As we've already discussed, people who are already discredited in the eyes of others manage tension but those who are discreditable manage information. Among the informational questions they must ask themselves include, should I display my stigma or not? Should I tell others about my stigma or not? Should I lie about it or not? And if so, to whom should I lie? These are daily questions that the stigmatized must answer for themselves. Many stigmatized individuals attempt to pass as a normal. Obviously, the more visible the stigma, the more it interferes with the normal flow of interaction and the more difficult it is to pass. For example, someone with a severe facial deformity may struggle to pass as a normal in almost any situation. But someone with a wheelchair may be able to temporarily pass, for example, as long as they're sitting around a table and there are other people also sitting around the table. Someone with an easily concealable stigma, for example, a birthmark on the chest or back, usually passes quite readily. The goal of those who wish to pass as normals is to manage information such that normals disattend to the stigma or simply don't realize that it's there. Goffman observes that the more intimate the relationship and the more repetitions there are of interaction, the more likely it is that the stigmatized are able to successfully pass as a normal. Of course, context is always key to managing social information. The stigmatized may choose to pass as a normal in some interactions, but they may make their stigma evident in others. When someone with a physical disability is parking in a disabled parking spot, they may want to display the stigma so that others will not question their decision to park there. But then when they enter the building, they may shift tact and attempt to conceal their disability again as best as possible. Let's talk a bit more about passing. Obviously, as a result of societal prejudice and discrimination, many stigmatized people are incentivized to pass as normals. Most, according to Goffman, will try to pass if they can. And if they are successful in passing, then they reap the rewards of a non-stigmatized interaction. Imagine an individual with a severe mental health problem attending a job interview. He or she may attempt to conceal that problem so as not to disadvantage the chances of landing the job. This might be difficult depending on the nature of the mental health problem. But discrimination against those with mental health problems often pushes mentally ill people to conceal their disabilities. But the problem, according to Goffman, is that even if you successfully pass in one interaction, you are still discreditable in future interactions and thus subject to social embarrassment. Obviously, anyone who leads a double life is susceptible to, for example, blackmail. It gets even more messy and complicated 
when someone is known to be stigmatized in one community, but not in another. In these circumstances, the stigmatized take active steps to isolate the social information by partitioning their social world. Maybe you attend a compulsive gambler support group, and you're open about your problem in that context. But you want to conceal this fact from work. But one night, you see a work colleague attending the same support group. More likely than not, you will not attend so that you can keep those social worlds separate. Finally, Goffman points out that if you've successfully passed and then your stigma is subsequently revealed during social interaction, the results can be distressing, sometimes extremely distressing. When an otherwise respectable member of society, for example, is found out to be a pedophile or a social deviant, their lives are dramatically disrupted. Consider, for example, the case of the primary school teacher who was found out to be a porn star. Now to the California science teacher who was fired after school officials learned that she had once starred in pornographic movies. She has been fighting to get her job back, and our newest ABC correspondent, Gio Benitez, has the story. Good morning, Gio. Good morning, Elizabeth. What this California teacher hoped would end as a story of redemption has now become a cautionary tale. What you do in the past can come back to haunt you. And this morning, her porn actress past may have gotten her banned from ever working in a classroom again. Her 12- and 13-year-old middle school students knew her as Miss Hallis, the science teacher. But fans of 32-year-old Stacy Hallis knew her as Tiffany Six, the porn star. This morning, she is out of a job, now banned from teaching. A panel of three California judges unanimously agreeing Tuesday that her hardcore past has no place in the classroom. We've had a a viral buzz going around with little 12- and 13-year-olds showing porn. The Oxnard School District initially fired Hallis last April after students at Haydock Intermediate School discovered she'd performed in at least 18 X-rated films from 2005 to 2006. In a behind-the-scenes audio interview posted on SmokingGun.com, Hallis reportedly talks about the dangers of her double life. It's a little risky, wouldn't you think? It's a little risky. Very risky for me. Why? Because I am a teacher. Do you think if they find out, you'll get fired? Uh, questionable, probably. Hallis's attorney says she never starred in any pornos while teaching. So in October, she appealed for her job back. But the state panel now says her testimony was full of misleading and evasive statements and outright falsehoods. I just feel as educators, we're the professionals, and we should uh, have a high standard for all of us. Hallis's attorney says she's changed her life and now only wants to be a teacher. She feels that by redeeming herself, she sees it as a positive message to anybody. And her attorney told me Hallis only performed in the X-rated films because she needed money. He says she's fearful of her future and wants a respectable job. She may now appeal to the Ventura County Superior Court. Right, but the fact that she was in the classroom at the same time that she was making those movies? Yeah, she was a full-time teacher right after that. Mm. Okay, thank you, Gio. So what have we learned this far? Goffman has demonstrated in Stigma that deviations from normality are widely perceived as shameful. Although slight deviations may be tolerated, significant deviations can result in ostracism and excommunication from the group. As a result, stigmatized individuals need to figure out how to manage the information surrounding their stigma. Now, one option is that the stigmatized can conceal or even obliterate all signs of the stigma. For example, if you have a criminal past, you could legally change your name. If you are a heroin addict, you could choose to shoot up heroin in your leg veins instead of in your arm veins where they would be more visible. If you're gay and living in a country that discriminates against homosexuals, You could get married and create the facade that you are heterosexual. All of these examples involve concealment strategies that prevent normals from seeing the reality of the stigma. Another option 
is to transform the stigma from a worse one to a better one. For example, someone who's deaf may try to pass off as simply an absent-minded daydreamer. Yet another option is to rely on wise normals to help conceal the defect. For example, many stigmatized people rely on their normal spouse to help conceal the stigma. A wife or a husband, for example, might notice a mental health episode coming on and quickly remove the stigmatized from the social situation. An unfortunately all too common option is for the stigmatized to simply self-isolate and to maintain distance from all normals. This is often the case with severely disabled people who have effectively given up on trying to be accepted in society or active in the labor market. Or another option is that a person who is discreditable may simply choose to voluntarily disclose the stigma and thus to deal with managing the tension instead of managing the information. At the very least, self-disclosure means you don't have to lie anymore or to worry about the fact that some social groups are aware of your stigma whilst others are not. Now, I think one major critique of Goffman's stigma is that he perceives all stigma as intrinsically bad. Well, this is incorrect. There's nothing inherently disadvantageous about a stigma. Yes, it's probably true that most deviations from normality, either in the way you look or the way you behave, reduce one's life chances. For example, having a stigma, especially a visible one, is associated with lower wages and higher levels of unemployment. However, there is such a thing as reverse stigma. This is where a stigma can potentially be seen as an advantage. Consider, for example, those who wear their stigma proudly as a badge of honor. A severely injured veteran who fought for his country may feel no shame at all in his stigma. Similarly, normals may have nothing but respect for his service to his country. Other forms of stigma can be used to, for example, sell products and services to stigmatize customers. Consider the case of an overweight woman who may face uh, looks-based discrimination in trying to work in a fashionable retail clothing shop, but she will receive priority treatment if she's applying to work in a plus-sized fashion store. Tattoos are another good example. This is an area where I've personally done quite a bit of research. A visible tattoo can be a liability for someone applying to be a doctor or a lawyer, but it can also be an asset for someone applying to work as a security guard or a bartender or as an automobile mechanic. The key point here is that context is key. Just because a person is stigmatized in one social situation doesn't mean that the stigma carries over into other situations. In other words, stigma may be much more complicated than Goffman lets on.